In the last episode of the Book of Enoch, we discussed the very first vision that Enoch had, where he delineates between the fates of the righteous and the sinners. There we saw him detail the consequences one might expect to happen, from the honest ones inheriting the earth and becoming blessed, to the dishonest ones being cursed to suffer. Amongst those who are damned are the watchers, those whom Enoch tells us would quake with great fear and would thereafter be seized unto the ends of the earth. In today's episode, we continue through the book of Enoch in chapters 6 to 8, which give us vivid details about these very watchers, who they were, what they wanted, and perhaps most importantly, how these evil angels corrupted mankind. The chapter begins to paint us an image of the era in which the watchers make their move. We are told that it was a time when man had multiplied greatly and humanity appeared to be on an upward trajectory, with more and more lives being born. In this time, we are told the daughters of men were comely and beautiful, not just in their looks, but in their innocence, spirit, and righteousness. It appeared to be a time where, if there was sin, it had not been proliferated or exacted in the capacity that would come to follow. But sin would soon make its mark on the earth when the Watchers, a group of angels in heaven, noticed the beautiful women and were enraptured by them. The most interesting takeaway from this chapter shows us that temptation is not just something humans have to deal with, but that even the angels themselves can be swayed by sin. The Watchers, as their name suggests, were deemed by God to do exactly that, to watch over the humans and never intervene. So, it is by this that we see them painted as something of antagonists in these chapters, for the very first action we see them commit is a violation of God's rules. The text tells us, And the angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. Notice that the chapter seeks to highlight the severity of temptation in that the angels, in this case referred to as the children of heaven, gave in to their impulses. They lay out their objective clearly in that they intend to take the women for themselves, have sex with them, and father offspring. This interestingly gives us a new idea that is not established in the Bible, that angels, at least the watchers in this case, are not only able to conceive their own plans, but are also able to produce offspring with human women. It would also appear that their desire wasn't just stirred by the beauty of the women, but by their desire to father children, suggesting that like us, the divine creatures also foster an innate urge to procreate, or at least share the values of the mortal men of the time, where extending one's own bloodline and legacy was imperative. The chapter continues to establish something of a hierarchy amongst the Watchers, and we are introduced to the leader named Semjaza. As the leader, Semjaza shows some restraint and opposes the bold idea suggested to him by his fellow angels. We are told, And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. There are two ways to read this particular line. One that paints Semjaza as noble and mindful of his place, or as already corrupt and something of an instigator as well. You'll notice he tells his fellow watchers that he fears that they will not do as they have proposed, and that by merely conceiving that idea, he will be the one to pay the price of sin. Considering that they were under his charge and thus led by his example, by remembering the sin in the first place, Semjaza shows us that he is aware of God's power over him and recognizes the consequences if his watchers were to act on this plan. No doubt, he too would be punished, for he would have certainly failed as their leader and perhaps in some way had cultivated such sinful thoughts amongst his own. But secondarily, some might say that Semjaza was as complicit, if not more so, than the others. You'll notice that he fears that they won't do the deed at all and follows it up by saying he alone would be the one to pay the penalty of great sin. In this, it can be interpreted that Semjaza is inciting the others by saying that he is the only one who is bold enough to do such a thing, hence why he would be the only one punished. He fears that they will not do as they say, and that upon execution of the plan, only he would be bold enough to fly down to earth, mate with a woman and father a son. In a sense, it can be said that Semjaza is calling the others chicken, 
But the others are quick to call Semjaza's bluff and tell him, let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual implications not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Here, the deceptiveness of Semjaza can be identified, for it can be said he provoked the others into action by suggesting that they were not as brave as him. With this, the Watchers not only allow the temptation of the women to get the better of them, uh, but they also demonstrate pride and appear to value Semjaza's opinion of them far more than that of God's. They do not want to appear cowardly in the eyes of their leader and would rather irk God than suffer such shame. Perhaps more likely, though, they crave the mortal women above all else, and Simjaza merely facilitated their ambitions and made the choice all the more enticing. The chapter continues with their descent to Earth, then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual implications upon it. And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual implications upon it. And these are the names of their leaders. Semjaza their leader, Arakiba, Ramil, Kokobiel, Tamil, Ramil, Danel, Ezekiel, Barakijal, Asael, or Azazel, Amoros, Bataro, Anano, Zakiel, Samsapil. Here we learn that there were a total of 200 angels who descended from the heavens to lay with mortal women and that their landing was upon the summit of Mount Hermon. We also learn that this all took place in the times of Jared, the father of Enoch, and the sixth generation descendant of Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, I cannot be certain about the pronunciation of the names of each of the angels, and depending on the translation or version of the Book of Enoch, the names can be spelled differently or appear entirely different altogether. However, the relevance of each angel's name does not appear to affect the Book of Enoch in any conceivable way and it would appear that the naming of the angels was merely the original author's method of giving some character or significance to these particular watchers, who were described as the chiefs and possibly the lieutenants of Semjaza. Chapter seven continues with the unfolding of the watcher's plan as we see them take the mortal women as wives. The text tells us, and all the others together with them um, took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. There is no indication that the women consent to the advances of the angels or whether they are taken by force, but it would perhaps not be so difficult for the angels to deceive the women into sleeping with them. In any case, we are told that the Watchers defiled themselves with the women, suggesting they engaged in multiple sexual debaucheries and moral turpitudes. But interestingly, it would seem that the Watchers did not return to heaven after, but instead stuck around for a bit, perhaps intrigued by the mortals or otherwise infatuated with their beauty. They began to teach them charms and enchantments, the cutting of roots, and gave them knowledge of plants. Here it can be interpreted that the Watchers taught the mortals the use of magic, which was forbidden knowledge and not the sort of thing that God had ever intended for man to wield. The charms and enchantments are unfortunately not specified in the text, but they appear to contribute to the earlier remark of the Watchers being defilers, perhaps defiling mankind's innocence with the practice of what might have become witchcraft or sorcery. We are then told more of the sin that would come to have greater repercussions on the earth, and that was the conception of the children between the Watchers and the mortal women. We are told, and they became pregnant, and they bore great giants whose height was 3,000 ells, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. Here we are told that the women gave birth not to regular babies, but instead bulbous beasts that were as tall as 3,000 L's, 3.429 kilometers, and not without a temper. These giants, thought to be the Nephilim, were monstrous and had insatiable appetites, so much so that we are told here that they consumed all the acquisitions of men, most likely their cattle. When the food ran out, the Nephilim turned violent and began to consume mankind themselves. So disastrous were the Nephilim that no one was able to keep them in check as they ran amuck on the earth, more savage than anything that had preceded them. 
Chapter 7 concludes by telling us that mankind were not the only victims of the Nephilim's rage, as we are told. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. The consequences of the Watcher's actions are dire, to say the least, and this is before God has even intervened. The Nephilim, instead, can be seen as an effect of karma, and also a caution that bad things will eventually take shape in one's life should they sin. The Watchers were probably not expecting to produce such monstrous creatures and saw only the short-term gratification of their needs. But the story seeks to show us that everything has a price. While Semjaza is seen to consider the ramifications of sinning, he only considers the consequences his actions will earn from God and omits the earth altogether. In this, the Watchers demonstrate arrogance and likely believe themselves to be so above man that they do not care about the repercussions that the mortals then have to sustain. The Nephilim, in this sense, then become man's problem, as the Watchers do not claim ownership of them, nor do they take fatherly responsibility for the creatures they have spawned. Their impetuous actions are even denounced by the Earth itself, where the Watchers are deemed as lawless ones. Considering the appetites of the Nephilim, I do not think it is out of the realm of possibility to suggest that they too tried to consume the Watchers, divine or not, and that here the Watchers may have come uh, to see the folly of their actions. In fact, it is uncertain whether the Watchers were really able to enjoy Earth thereafter, nor whether they themselves were even strong enough to oppose the creatures that they had fathered. It seems unlikely that they were a match for the Nephilim, considering the description that goes into the creatures, those that are such ravenous creatures that they even turn cannibal and start feasting on each other's flesh and blood. Chapter 8 of the Book of Enoch tells us more about what the Watchers taught mankind whilst they were on Earth and how they went about with their corruption. We are told of Azazel, a Watcher who taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments, and the use of antimony, and the beautifying of the eyelids, and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. Despite not being the leader of the Watchers, much of the condemnation in the fallout is reserved for Azazel, who we later learn is pursued by the archangel Raphael with the utmost prejudice. Perhaps because, unlike Semjaza and the others who taught the mortals magic, Azazel taught them how to make weapons and, worse yet, how to use them. With this idea, it is believed that Azazel showed men how to hurt each other, how to wage conflict on each other, and how to kill each other, instilling in man a sense for warfare. The magic given to mankind by the other Watchers was perhaps harmless, inconsequential even, but the crafting of swords, knives, shields, and breastplates that were taught by Azazel brought only pain and suffering, right? You'll also notice that Azazel is responsible for man's mastery over the metals of the earth and the art of crafting them into bracelets and ornaments, objects that would be fought over or even idolized by mankind. It is these sorts of items in jewelry, ornaments, and costly stones that would inspire greed and envy, destructive sins that would corrupt man. The beautifying of the eyelids is another interesting aspect mentioned in the passage, and some have thought that this was in relation to makeup and cosmetics, and that Azazel taught the less beautiful women how to compete with those who were naturally blessed in the looks department. Some have also said that this painting of the face was a deception and that Azazel instructed the women to do this in an effort to entice men and make the world promiscuous. In any case, the Watcher's efforts to corrupt man were successful, as chapter 8 tells us, and there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. The other Watchers are also named and shamed in this part of the chapter, where we are told Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings, Amaros, the resolving of enchantments, Barakijal taught astrology, Kokobal, the constellations, Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds, Arakiel, the signs of the earth, Shamziel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. Here we are given more insights as to what mankind was taught and how, in the eyes of God, his creation was corrupted. Mankind appears to have been given the keys to the universe during the Watcher's visit, 
And while some of these teachings might seem benign enough, the Book of Enoch reserves that this was not God's intention and that the Watchers had superseded him, thus angering him beyond measure. Some might also say that with the Watchers teaching mankind about the signs of the earth, the sun and the moon, as well as the constellations and the clouds, man gained independence from God. But in doing so, it can also be said that the Watchers invoked in man a thirst for understanding and the cultivation of an ambitious attitude that would set man off in seeking knowledge more than salvation. But the teachings of the Watchers would not be enough to fend off the rage of the Nephilim as the creatures brought down devastation upon the earth. The landscape was battered, animals were slaughtered, men and women torn apart. Chapter 8 concludes by telling us, And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. With these cries, the antics of the Watchers and the destruction of their offspring would become apparent to the Archangels, for those that were already preparing God's vengeance. But. That's all we have time for on today's episode of the Book of Enoch. If you want to know how God responds to seeing what the Watchers have done on Earth, uh, we made a video titled The Vengeance of the Archangels. Check it out. If you've enjoyed today's video, let me know in the comments below. And as always, don't forget to give this one a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. See you soon.